Okay. And hello everybody and welcome to another evening at Goyle Festival. Um, tonight I have to say, um, no bias to anyone else, but this is the talk I've been most excited for myself um, because it's a little bit of um, my academic background um, is looking at dystopian fiction and um, this book I don't have a copy with me, but I do have a chalkboard. <laughs> um, it, we by Evgeny Zamyatin is an often overlooked um, book that highly, highly influenced 1984. Um, and also, I think it, he denied it, but um, influenced Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Um, with me tonight, I have Dr. Julie Curtis, who is Professor, professor of Russian Literature uh, um, and Fellow of Wolfson College, Oxford. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Julie. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to talk about Zamyatin. Um, so, how did you start? Um, to, just how did you start researching Zamyatin? And um, was this a long book? In the she's author of the book, um, the English man from Lebedian. Is that how you say it? Lebedian, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not at all how I said it then. <laughs> so easy to say. <laughs> um, where did where did your process begin? Well, I had um, actually read Zamyatin and um, his close friend Bulgakov as, uh, as when I was an undergraduate studying Russian. And um, they were both authors who I found really fascinating. Um, and in the end, I, I embarked on a whole lot of research on Bulgakov primarily, who's very well known for the novel The Master of Margarita. Um, but Zamyatin was always in the back of my mind. And when I had um, a period of sabbatical leave from my teaching job, um, I sort of looked around and this was in the late 1990s, the Soviet Union had collapsed and various opportunities for getting into archives um, were beginning to become much easier. And um, when I thought about it, I realized that uh, there really wasn't a, a biography of Zamyatin. Um, Zamyatin was born in 1884 and died in 1937. So you'd think that this was something that had been tackled before. But within the Soviet Union, um, Zamyatin, who emigrated to Paris in 1931, became a non-person and he wasn't mentioned um, and it wasn't possible to write about him for decades and decades after his death. And um, so, so that was one reason was that um, there was a it was a timely thing that needed doing. And the other thing was that Zamyatin was somebody who had spent some time in, in Britain he spent 18 months uh, in um, Newcastle on Tyne um, during the First World War because he'd been trained as a naval architect and I was actually sent by the Russian government to supervise the construction of icebreakers in Newcastle. Um, so there's a British part of his life. And then um, in 1931, he immigrated and ended up in Paris where he stayed until his death in 1937. And I speak French um, as well as Russian, and therefore that put me in a very good position to not only get access to archives in the relevant places, but really try and do research to understand these contexts. And um, so I embarked on this biography, um, which took me a very long time to write, and it only came out in 2013 um, in a, uh, with an, an American publisher. And um, it's still the only full biography of Zamyatin. Um, uh, there isn't um, one in Russian um, which covers the whole of his life yet. So, uh, and so in fact, I mentioned to you that uh, I'm very pleased at the moment it's actually being translated into Russian and it should be coming out in the next month or so in Russia as well. That's so exciting. What has the process been like for having your own book translated? Um, it's quite complicated and it's very strange. Um, one of the things that you learn is that what you think is of your of as your entirely lucid English <laughs> turns out to be really complicated and tortuous. <laughs> and um, but actually, I had a I ran a, a tiny competition. Um, I just advertised it locally in my university, um, inviting people to have a go at translating a couple of paragraphs, and sort of went with my instinct. Uh, with the person who not only clearly understood what I was saying um, properly, but somehow had a voice which worked. And so we worked closely together over a period of about a year. Um, she's called Yulia Savikovska. And uh, she was somebody I'd met actually, we'd done a lot of projects on another of my research interests is, is Russian drama. And we'd done a lot of, of work together on various things. And so I'd got to know her. 
Um, and she was very reliable and very good. And so there was a, a, an exchange. We sort of, she would send me a first draft and I would respond um, and, you know, realize that there were some things that I, I wasn't confident about. Um, and she knew a much better way of saying something than I, than I had realized. Um, so I learned quite a lot about it. And then actually since then, uh, it's been edited again by the publishing house in, in which is, a, is the Russian branch of the American publisher. Um, and so there's been more input from them as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's taken, well, a year and a half to, to get to this point, but as I say, the, the I'm in the middle of the proofs at the moment. So uh, that's quite a, quite a strange task. But it is odd to read one's voice in another language especially working on proofs because I'm actually staring with great attention at every word to make sure that it's exactly right. Um, so it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite a surreal experience, not one that people have every day. No, and I, and I can't quite imagine. I mean, there, there are two issues. One of them is um, what my voice will sound like in Russian. It's absolutely not a Russian academic voice. Um, it's neither... Um, it's neither as formal as some of the sort of most um, highbrow writing, um, but it's also not as subjective as quite a lot of biographical writing is in Russian. Um, so I'm, I don't know, I, I, I don't necessarily expect it to be well received, but I know it's a useful document in the sense that if you're writing a first biography, um, although it's now become a little bit fashionable to sort of look down on cradle to grave biographies, in a sense, somebody's got to do the first one. Somebody's got to actually lay out, you know, what was happening when and the sequence. And, and actually it does that sort of chronological approach sort of throws up some quite interesting issues. So on the one hand, I can establish that you know, on the day when he wrote his most furious and bitter letter to his wife um, when he was in England and she was refusing to come and join him, he also started a certain story um, on that, literally on the same day. And one can see echoes and connections. That's just a sort of coincidence. But one can also, through the chronological process, um, sort of work out reasonably important things, as, for example, um, the date of the completion of his most famous novel, We. Um, almost all the literature that has been written about it uses a particular memoir where somebody says, oh, in the summer of 1921, Samyatin was polishing his novel, polishing off his novel. Um, and it's only when you look at the chronology that it becomes perfectly clear from all the surrounding details that it could not possibly be 1921. It must have been 1920 or possibly even 1919. So you can actually establish some fairly fundamental things like what is the date of when this book was written um, by doing this sort of very scrupulous um, run through of dates. <laughs> so anyway, I think it'll be of use to some people who want to sort of then do other more adventurous things. Um, the biography is available um, through open access. So I will link it below for anyone who wants to read it um, because I... <laughs> I really like it was really interesting because I would never look too deeply into sort of he, how he came to write because that wasn't the focus of anything I was working on um, and it was so interesting and um, in particular I will bring them up later but those quotes from Orwell in your conclusion yes. were so, so telling um, so I just wanted before we move on to talk a bit about um, your process of writing the biography um, because did you have any adventures or anything that came up that was um, unexpected whilst writing it? Well I did have one, one extraordinary experience which is sort of what an academic rather dreams of and it doesn't often happen um, which was that I the, the, for various reasons a lot of uh, Zamyatin's archives um, are not only in Russia and in France where he lived for a long time but many of them ended up in different parts of America so I, I used about half a dozen different American archives and one day I was in Princeton um, looking at a very small collection of correspondence and the man who brought the letters to me said hmm Samyatin I've just moved here from Albany which is upstate New York it's the state capital of New York uh, we've got Samyatin up there we've got some Samyatin. and it hadn't come up on any of the 
catalogues and things. So I literally got on a small plane um, and went up to Albany to see what they'd got and took the lid off the box. And there was the typescript of his most famous novel in Russian, the original typescript, which is the only extant source material anywhere in the world for this text. <laughs> <laughs> like I've got goosebumps now, I'm even thinking about that. Your dropping moment. It had, even for complete authenticity, one page missing. Um, and because the, the, no I mean, the novel had a very, very complicated publication history, he, he essentially completed it in about 1920. Um, but it wasn't published in Russia until 1988. So... <laughs> 68, 68, nearly 70 years after it was written, it first was published as, of course, a lot of dissident and satirical and subversive literature was as the Soviet Union came to an end um, in, the, in the era of glasnost. Um, and when they published it in Russia, the only source they could use was um, an American emigre publication in 1952. And they literally just had to copy that Oh, wow. It was the only only text in Russian. It was the only source. Um, and although it's, it's fantastic that it was published in 1952, it was a very untidy publication in the sense of actually some unfinished sentences and things. So we actually really did need an original text of the book. And so that didn't. It was one of the reasons why the biography took so long is that I swerved sideways. Um, and I have a wonderful colleague in St. Petersburg called Marina Lubimova, who is a wonderful Zamyatin expert. And she and I produced, um, in fact, I can show it to you if you like. This, yes, is, the, this is the authorized uh, copy uh, uh, edition of the novel We in Russia, which came out in 2011, edited by me and Marina. So that's, this is it. This is what it looks like in Russia. Oh, that is just, what, so, a, what a find. It was extraordinary. And in fact, uh, to, in, the same, in that same collection where the box was, there were also 35 really important letters that he'd written um, to cover the period, particularly in Paris, about which we knew least of all. So that was another publication um, and, a, and a very useful resource for the biography. But it doesn't often happen that you stumble across something um, in this know, way. Did you know immediately what it was? Or was it sort of like a slow realization? <laughs> well, I had to go away and check, but only mm. as far as I knew. Um, and I actually then uh, went to a a conference in St. Petersburg a year later and said, oh, by the way, I found, I found a typescript. And they went, woo, they all came rushing around to find out about it. But that's why, um, I mean, obviously it needed to be um, uh, presented by a, a, a respected Russian scholar because she was able to provide you know, far more background. And it's, it's one of the sort of paradoxes of having been a, a specialist on Russian literature and on 20th century Russian literature living in the West and of my generation, in other words, some, you know, when I started going, it was still the Soviet Union. And when I was a graduate student, it was still the Soviet Union. Is that um, one has to be humbly aware that as a Westerner, you had massive access to, not only to archives, but also to publishing opportunities, which meant that it's possible to do these fairly fundamental tasks, like you know, writing the first biography or producing the scholarly edition or publishing somebody's correspondence which in any normal open uh, society would be done by the the, the native scholars um, I mean it's really uh, whose, whose scholarship is far deeper and, and broader than mine um, so I'm very conscious that I'm offering a, uh, a slightly amateurish outsider contribution but for the moment even now it's still there are still some things that that it's possible to do simply by virtue of living in the West and being freer to travel and having more money to do that sort of thing. Um, but the the Russian scholarship is is terrific, but it does sometimes sometimes is a bit limited by um, lack of awareness. It's very odd with Zamyatin, for example, um, given that the novel was only published in 1988 and um, it was only possible really to start talking about him then. Um, there are many, many, many doctorates and books written in the West about Zamyatin long before the Russians have been able to, to write about him themselves. He's now become a classic. He's on all their university and school syllabuses and so on. But 
um, one of the things I contributed to that to this edition was simply a survey of Western scholarship just to say well you know there are these studies out there so if you want to think about the imagery or if you want to talk about the some of the ideas behind it then you know there are existing articles in English or French or whatever um, which one could look at. If you had to sum up um, Zamyatin's importance, also, sorry, side note, um, when I was doing it, I was spelling Zamyatin with a Y. Is that incorrect? Because I noticed you use an I. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. There, there are different transliteration schemes and, and, and each one is equally valid. Um, it's just, it's, I get slightly muddled because different publishers turn out to have different transliteration schemes. And no, as soon as you've sort of adopted one, you then have to unlearn it and learn another one. So it's, it's completely unimportant, but yeah. <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, so if you had to sum up why he's important and um, what what his biggest, not his biggest, you know, how he has influenced um, in particular the world of dystopian literature, I think you have a really beautiful sentence in your book where you feel like he is the bridge between, um, so the history of um, dystopian fiction comes from utopian fiction and his reaction to it, and that H.G. Wells is obviously the big author of the start of dystopian fiction, and that Zamyatin is this bridge between H.G. Wells and Orwell and Huxley. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I mean, that's, that's not my idea. A very, very uh, good scholar and translator called Michael Glennie, I think, is the person who, who I'm quoting Michael Glennie when I mention that. But um, it does make very good sense to me uh, because H.G. Wells obviously is, is, we think of as the sort of you know, father figure of science fiction. Um, and it's, it's particularly focused on the science, I think, um, H.G. Wells. He's really fascinated by the, by the potential of science to transform lives. Um, and Zamyatin was an English speaker. Um, he he learnt English while he was studying. He didn't learn it at school, but he learnt it while he was studying um, in his, his courses in St. Petersburg as a naval architect. But he then spent um, 18 months in the northeast of, of England. Um, and when he came back in the 1920s to Soviet Russia, um, there was a sort of visionary project led by Maxim Gorky uh, called World Literature, in which the idea was that you would translate progressive works or works of interest from all across the world. And he was, as I met him, was chosen as one of the couple of people who would be responsible for the English section because of their fluency in the language. And so um, Zamyatin did actually um, edit a great many of the translations of H.G. Wells. He didn't tend to do the translations himself, but he wrote the introductions and organized it all. So he was absolutely immersed in H.G. Wells. Um, I have to say that most of that work, I mean, he, he also received H.G. Wells when H.G. Wells came to visit the Soviet Union in 1919. Um, but my view is that by that time he'd, he'd more or less finished writing the first draft of We. Um, so it's not that I think the text is directly influenced by the H.G. Wells, but he would certainly be. I mean, the Russians were very well read and they, they, they knew these texts. Um, and then the novel We was, was, as I say, not published in Russia. It was banned, but it did find its way out to the West and it was published um, in Czech. It was published in, in English and not a very good translation in America. And it was published in French. And actually the French translation is something that Aldous Huxley could have seen. Because um, Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World when he was living in France. Um, and the French translation of Zamiatin's We, um, under the title Nous Autres, came out in 1929. And uh, Huxley published Brave New World in 1932. I don't think it matters terribly that, you know, Huxley said he hadn't read it. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to have read something. You can pick up ideas that are floating around. But actually, we do know, I was um, very grateful to a, a colleague who's a Huxley specialist here in Oxford, who's able to um, help me track down an article that uh, Huxley wrote in, in 1932 two or three, I think, which in, in which he talked about Zamyatin. So he, was, he certainly knew about Zamyatin as an essayist. So he talked about him being, um, he say he's, in fact, I think Huxley said, um, the Russians are, are capable of being the greatest prophets at the moment. So yes, there's a sort of Anglo-Russian uh, conversation going on. And then the, the story with Orwell is that during the war, um, 
who all read a, uh, a book about contemporary Russian literature and met its author. And he told him that um, he was very interested to hear about Zamyatin because he himself had been thinking about a book along these lines and was already taking notes for it. And this is what, this is 1944, but it's what would become um, uh, uh, 1984 itself. Um, and what's so striking is that George Orwell, who was already um, quite uh, beginning to be ill and would become very ill, uh, writes uh, 1984 between, I think, about 1946 and 49, 48. Um, and during that time, he, he writes at least nine letters to publishers and to this Russian colleague who he'd met to try and get a new translation. Uh, he insisted that it was a really important book, that it was a better book than Huxley's, um, that it was a book that people needed to read. And um, so, in fact, it was George Orwell who retrieved Zamyatin's reputation because Zamyatin had died in, and people hardly knew about him and none of the translations had really made a big impact. And it was George Orwell and then this American professor, or Russo Russian, who went on to become an American a professor in America, who between them made sure that the book was retrieved. And I think a book which was read, it was not very well translated, um, it didn't make a huge impact in, in certainly in the author's lifetime or even immediately afterwards, um, proved after the Second World War to have been extraordinarily prophetic. Um, so, I mean, we could go and talk a bit more about what the novel itself has to say, I think. In, in yeah, that. I think so too. This was the bit, um, This just what you were speaking about is the bit that excited me most, learning how much Orwell championed this book. Yeah. I think that's just a lovely way of thinking about it. And that Orwell, there are so many similarities um, and that Orwell was really open and like this was, I think that's wonderful. Um, so the book itself um, is structured into time log like diary entries um, and they describe um, D-503 <laughs> um, and um, this one state world um, that has obvious parallels to the Soviet Union. You're, it's very grey. Um, I mean, maybe I should let you continue. <laughs> Yes. Well, I mean, the interesting, I mean, it's interesting that the links between the, the Orwell and the, and the um, Zemetin are, are on all sorts of levels, including the, yes, the, the fact of a diary, which the, the un, unwitting protagonist starts writing. But of course, it's a fatal mistake because it's going to reveal his thoughts, not only to us, the reader, but also to, to the authorities in due course. Um, but um, there's also a really fundamental way in which um, both texts are alike in that neither of them are in fact, I would argue, specifically directed against a particular state. Um, I mean, Orwell said um, when he was asked that he had, that he was equally preoccupied with the dangers of fascism um, in Germany, Nazi fascism and Soviet communism. And he had set it in England because nobody should delude themselves in thinking that we were somehow special, that we weren't uh, capable of succumbing to the same dangers. So that his, is, is, his, vis his own vision of 1984 was that it was a book with universal significance and not, not a particular political satire on, on one regime, it's not an anti-Soviet book. And although um, Zemyatin's We was banned by the Soviet authorities and assumed to be anti-Soviet, um, there are two things which make that far from obvious when you think about it. One of them is that if it's written in, as I would argue, 1919, 1920, it doesn't really matter because what we need to remember is that after the, the, the two revolutions in 1917, which came after three years of First World War, um, Russia is then plunged into civil war. The Bolshevik coup of 19, 1917 is, not, is only the beginning of their seizure of power. And the country is enduring civil war until 1921. In other words, this book is written in the middle of a civil war going on. Um, the Allies, including the British, blockaded um, supplies. It, there was starvation. There were people lived in terrible conditions. The country was absolutely wrecked. Um, and there was fighting going on and so on. This is not the squeaky clean 
um, vision of a, total, of, a, of a fully developed totalitarian society. It absolutely was not what, was, what Zamyatin could see all around him. It was certainly anticipated in Bolshevik propaganda about what might happen in the future, but it wasn't a depiction of what was happening around him now. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, let me just come back to um, Zamyatin's experience in England. Um, being th this relationship between Britain and Russia has was a very long established one um, between the northeast, the time, the shipbuilding, and so on. And uh, Newcastle was the the most um, advanced place for building icebreakers at the time, and icebreakers were really crucial for the Allies to keep contact because the Germans were blocking the Baltic. It's difficult to to imagine just how important Newcastle was um, at that time, or the time that they they produced during the First World War something like they launched one vessel a week during the First World War. It was a massive workforce across the various shipyards, very international, very controlled because the, the, the authorities were very anxious by the, the many of the workers were, were foreign nationals and they might either be industrial spies or subversives. So it was a highly industrialized highly controlled environment using all those things which had been developed say by Henry Ford or all those ideas F.W. Taylor so conveyor belts um, production lines or time and motion studies so it was it was the cutting edge of technology in, in its time and it was controlled like a police state and its international significance is, is marked by the fact that at the end of the first world war there were 23 consulates in Newcastle. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> from 1916 through until the autumn of 1917. And he then starts writing this novel within a year or two. So it seems to me he's absolutely bringing together anxieties about the ways in which technology was going in the industrialized West, as well as uh, what was happening in Soviet Russia. So, there's, the, and there's no doubt at all, I mean, there are also other stories that he's written which, which uh, in some ways bring that English experience to bear on, on, uh, on what, be, what might be going to happen in Russia. Um, so it's a warning about the dangers of industrialization and technology as much as it's um, uh, a warning about the dangers of totalitarian ideology. Um, I, th that is just <laughs> the, the message and the work that I'm so interested in. I think that um, there's a lot of publications at the moment. I can actually, I've got a lot of them in within my reach. Um, hang on, we've got a few there. And then we've got a few here, which are all essentially, oh, hang on, I'll bring them up a little bit closer, mm -hmm. all about um, technology and industry and um, the dangers of both. And it's certainly a, idea that is very um, familiar to us at the moment and also that is sort of in a lot of these works I think there is a tension between the dangers that they're highlighting and then the sort of need for um, a book to to end nicely and not on too down a note and they tend to end with sort of um, an idea of education an idea that we can educate our ways out of it and I think that there's I think that's obviously um, what we hope we can do, but I think that um, what Zamiatin has to offer is sort of a, a complementary, um, or the original <laughs> um, critique of that. Yes, because he, he and Orwell, I mean, both their novels end with the protagonist who has made an attempt to rebel and become independent, essentially being tortured and brainwashed into submission. I mean, they're not, it's not a positive, they're, neither of the stories have a positive ending um, and they're very similar in that sort of a muted ending of a submission to the authorities. Are there any other works of Zamiatin's? I've actually never read any of his, his other books. Are there any in English um, and what would you recommend? Um, yes, the, the, he, he's actually he's a writer with an extraordinary range. Um, before he started writing books like this, he was actually known as someone who sort of celebrated the quirky, sleepy eccentrics of provincial Russia. <laughs> um, not at all somebody who wrote about it with a, with a modernist eye uh, for the urban environment. But um, I think of particular interest to an English reader, there's a story called The Islanders, um, which he did write while he was in Newcastle, and which quite, in quite interestingly anticipates some of the themes um, of the novel We. 
So that's certainly one that you might enjoy looking at. Um, there are a couple of other stories. There's an extraordinary story called The Flood, um, which is set in a sort of slightly timeless, possibly Dostoevsky in St. Petersburg. Um, and it's, it's Dostoevsky in its preoccupation with murder and it's the, somehow the floods which um, uh, afflict the city, which do, do afflict the city fairly regularly because it's on a rather exposed position geographically, sort of are tied in with the sort of menstrual cycle of the heroine and her thoughts about murder and blood and childlessness and so on. So it's a, it's a rather um, shocking story as well, quite a violent story. Um, but it's, it's wonderfully written. And he's also a, a terrific essayist. Um, I mean, there are plenty of other short stories and other significant novels, really. Um, he writes some, a, a whole range of very varied short stories, but also some rather wonderful essays, very colourful essays. Um, I think uh, my favourite one is about, um, there we go, um, it's, it's essentially the title is, I haven't got the title immediately in my head, um, uh, about my wives, Russia and icebreakers. Um, that kind of thing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, um, um, is, uh, where, where should I go next? To Bulgakov? Because I know that a lot of your work is actually about um, Mikhail Bul Bulgakov. <laughs> Bulgakov, he's called. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stop now. Just <laughs> it's just, I know, it's, it's Russian words each have a particular stress, but you can't know it as a foreigner, so there's no <laughs> way you can guess, and it's completely reasonable to call him Bulgakov, but as it happens, the Russians call him Bulgakov, so that's all. Um, if yeah. you, what, what was his relationship with um, Zamyatin, and um, if you also wanted to talk a little bit about um, your work you do on Bulgakov, <laughs> um, please do. <laughs> um, well, they, they became good friends. Um, Zamyatin actually, who's um, uh, at least his senior as a writer and a little bit older, um, spotted Bulgakov early on and celebrated him as a sort of new voice in the early 1920s. Um, but they had a lot in common. And biographically, they both came from families of priests. They both were marvelous satirical writers. They both wrote plays as well as uh, prose. Um, and they really liked drinking together and playing poker and whatever. Um, and uh, in fact, their lives ran in parallel for a certain time. They both tried to get out of the Soviet Union at the same time. Um, Bulgakov was not allowed to, to, was not given permission by Stalin to leave. And, this, and it, we do mean Stalin. I mean, it's literally Stalin himself is asked by Maxim Gorky whether these two people may leave and one of them gets a yes and the other gets a no. And they sort of stayed in touch. Um, but yes, and Bulgakov, um, well, I've done, I've done two biographies of Bulgakov um, because one of them I wrote and published um, for his centenary, but it was in fact the year the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. And assembling them, it was, a, it, was a, um, it was called Manuscripts Don't Burn, which is a very famous phrase from his novel and is an affirmation obviously of the enduring power of art to survive, which of course turns out to be true both about Zamyatin's we, but also about Bulgakov's. Uh, text and he like Zamyatin was banned and his book was also Master Margarita was only published a quarter of a century after after the author's death um, and I wrote a, um, a biography in letters and diaries because I'd been able to work in archives and, and basically when I was a graduate student working on Bulgakov in the Soviet Union I was treated as a spy I was regarded as a spy um, and I wasn't allowed into a lot of the archives and people smuggled bits of information out to me, which I copied out by hand. I had to fake about half the footnotes in my doctorate um, because I had to say that such and such was in such an archive. But in fact, I'd, got, I'd made a copy of somebody else's notes from an archive, but I couldn't possibly say that I was sure. But my examiners agreed this is the only, it was the only correct thing yeah. to do. Um, and at the end of our stay, because the, the authorities in, in Moscow were very, were sort of pretty unhappy about us being there poking about. So at the end of our stay, um, as graduate students under the auspices of the British Council, we were allowed illegally to smuggle two kilograms of notes and microfilms out through the diplomatic bag. So actually, when I was doing my research on Bulgakov, um, I then came home and had to go along to King Charles Street to the Foreign Office and get my plastic bag and take it back to Oxford to write my doctorate. <laughs> so this is, anyway, so, so I had sort of little snippets of information which I put together in, in for biography in 1991. 
And then 25 years later, um, in 2017, I wrote a new biography with a lot more access to, to the new information that had been published in the meantime. Um, and I've just published a, a reader's companion to the Master Margarita that came out at the end of last year um, and some other things as well. But um, Bulgakov is, is also an, he's a, very, he's a very original, he's a very unique kind of writer. Um, Master Margarita is unlike anything else. Um, fantastical, funny, beautiful, moving, enigmatic. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a lovely book which I, which I started to read before I went to university and uh, it continues to give pleasure and it's a it's a fun text to teach students come through the door saying what was that <laughs> just a good way to start a tutorial or a discussion anyway so it took my dad um 16 years i think he started um, the master of margarita you know when he was in his 20s and he only finished it um, um, and maybe a few years ago, I'm not sure how old that, if that works out right, chronology. anyway, it took him a long time to read it and he was so, it's just, it's, yeah, it's an incredibly exciting book. It is a fun book and it's, anyway, so, you know, there was just this extraordinary buzz in the 1920s and into the 1930s before Stalin closed it all down with the terror and repression and socialist realism, but um, Russian language writing in the 1920s, 1910s, 1920s and into the 30s was just a ferment of ideas and originality. Um, it's, a, it's a great period to study. So uh, yeah. although it's, a lot of it ends up ends rather tragically for the individuals concerned, um, it's, uh, it's a great period to be studying. Absolutely is. And um, we can't, obviously, um, we can't recommend um, Zamyatin in particular, we enough. Um, he lived through an incredible period of history as well. I always sort of am amazed by sort of 1884 to 1937. Yes. What, a, what a time to have lived and written and um, he's had an incredible impact um, and yeah so thank you so much for talking to me um, and I, I'm just uh, so interested in everything that you've said today. Well thank you, really enjoyed it and <laughs> I hope you'll go on reading more Russian books. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> it's lovely to talk to you.